I'm about to show you a great trick to quickly animate rounded shapes without ruining them or your sanity in the process. Hey, I'm Steve Savali, a freelance animator, designer, and educator. And sometimes animating is just hard, or other times you just wanna see other people's techniques. So today I'm gonna to show you my biggest trick to animating a perfect smear and distorting a shape every time. Animating shapes is super fun. It is hands down one of my favorite things to do as an animator, and it's a very popular trend right now. The other thing is it really gives you an opportunity to push and rely on the basic principles of animation. Today, we're gonna do that. We're gonna focus on squash and stretch, which is gonna give us an amazing sense of weight. We're gonna look at anticipation. There's gonna be a little bit of buildup, and we're gonna have exaggeration to an extent, also known as smears. We're gonna create this to give us a sense of speed in this fake motion blur. Before we begin, be sure to download the project files in the link below so you can follow along with me. All right, so let's make a new comp. We're gonna go 1920 by 1920. Let's just name this circle so we stay somewhat organized. 24 frames a second is perfect, and we're gonna go with just a second, just because today we're gonna to be talking about the technique, not creating a finished piece. So let's hit OK. Let's go through, just try to keep this organized. And now knowing that we're gonna do a circle and then we're gonna have that nice bounce, by default, it's really quick and easy to go into your shape builder tools and just use an ellipse. I like to do it a completely different way though. I will go in and I will actually use a rectangle and holding shift, I'm gonna pull out to get a perfect square shape. You'll see that my anchor point snaps to the middle. I'll click onto my layer go to my position and I'm going to separate those dimensions right out the gate. I'm going to right click separate so that way I can tackle these individually. Today, we're only focusing on the Y position. And then we want this to be in the center of our comp. Our center of our comp is going to be half of our comp width. So if we go into comp settings 1920, we know if we go 960, we'll be in the dead center. So we're creating just a nice, easy, nice, quick bounce. And we want a little bit of buildup in the beginning. So I'm not going to set a keyframe for the Y position right here at the start because I want at least two frames where it kind of builds up. And you'll get better over time of assessing and knowing how long things should take. So I'll set a keyframe here. Let's go forward. Let's say eight frames. We'll pull our object up, holding shift. Then let's go forward another eight frames. And then I'm just going to copy and paste that keyframe so I know I get a perfect start stop point. So I'd get a nice clean loop. So if I watch this, this looks terrible. And you're like, how does this become a circle? How does this become appealing in any way? So right out of the gate, I want to show you one of my favorite tricks. And I treated this kind of the same way how you could treat a rectangle or a square in Adobe Illustrator. I'm going to go through, I'm going to scroll down to the rectangle path, convert to Bezier path. Now this gives us the option to have Bezier handles if we want, or just our 90 degree hard edges, which is perfect for this case, because then I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna hit add, and I'm gonna go to round corners. What that's gonna do is it's gonna give me a radius option, and I'm gonna hold Control Shift H on a PC, which if you watch, our toggle mask shape path visibility turns on and off so I can see it, and I'm gonna pull this until it becomes a perfect circle. And I don't really want to go too much further past that. So I'm just eyeballing it. It ends up being about 166. The reason why I don't want to go too much past that is because we're going to animate this. And if we shoot this up to 500, well, trying to get into 500 and then maybe go back down to 100 on the radius at another point of this animation, it's just going to get sloppy. You're going to rush through 400 points before even getting to anything. So we're going to just keep that at 166. We're gonna watch this and now we have just a nice clean ball bounce. Let's move this keyframe over with terrible movement. So we're gonna grab our Y position. We're gonna go into our graph editor. I like to animate with both my reference graph and value graph up. That's just my personal preference. So we're gonna to start to pull out these Bezier handles. I'm holding Alt right now and I'm clicking and I'm just trying to create what would be a nice ball bounce, which means we're going to leave the ground fast. We're going to ease at the top so we get that nice little hold. And then we're gonna go screaming back down into our contact point. So if I set up my RAM preview area here and here, and we watch, 
passable. That might have been a little bit too extreme. I just want to make sure that this is solid first before I do any squash and stretch or any smearing. Because if I just this later on down the line, uh, I may have to go backwards and start adjusting the squash and stretch and it just becomes more of a pain. So I make sure that this looks really good first. Then anything I do from this point on, I know is just going to be icing on the cake. Now let's talk about getting into squash and stretch. I have a comp here where I have just a basic ball bounce going. And here's a couple issues that can happen. Right out of the gate, I animated this ball with the anchor points in the middle because by default, it should be or it will be close to the middle. Now, if you were to animate a ball bounce and you wanted to do anything with scale with squash and stretch, a lot of people will actually use scale. So they'll uncheck this box and they'll start scaling it in the X and scaling it in the Y. So now if I show my rulers hitting control semicolon, it kind of works, but as I start to leave the ground and if I start to counter animate things, I may have points where the shape isn't resting on the ruler, it starts to get sloppy. And then the other part is if I scale in the Y now because I didn't move my anchor point, I've created more issues because now I should be on this ground plane, but now I have to go in and I have to start counter animating. And that's gonna get sloppy because if I do that and I start to move forward, there can be times where maybe I dip below. And this is my opinion. I don't like seeing any shape distortion where it's just scales because it's not giving me any sense of weight. I don't feel like this thing's getting heavier and trying to pin itself to the ground. I'd love to see some of those heavier points kind of hit and push off the ground rather than it always being that center contact point. So that's why I do it a little bit different. I'll go in and knowing that we've created this using a square, I'm gonna hit Control Shift H just so I can see my visibility again. I'm gonna twirl down my options. I'm gonna go into my path. I'm gonna set a keyframe. I'm gonna go into my rounded corners. I have a keyframe here. And then using the quick key U with the layer selected, I'm gonna hide everything except for the properties that I have animated. For me, this makes it a whole lot cleaner when I get into animation. So right out the gate, we know we have a perfect shape. We need that kind of squash stretch. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go forward two frames before we even leave the ground. I'm gonna grab this and I'm gonna to start to move it down. And I'm gonna also move it out a little bit. Might be a little bit too much. And if you look at this, all right, now we're starting to get a little bit more sense of weight, but it still feels a little sloppy. You look at it and you're like, Steve, this isn't much different than scaling, but that's where our radius comes into play. And this is where I said, don't go too high on the radius because now holding Control Shift H, I'm gonna hide my visibility again. I'm gonna just start to kind of create what I feel is a nice shape that this circle would go down to. So now if I scrub, let's pull up, pull down a ruler. You can see I stay on my ground plane, I distort and I actually feel that sense of weight. And as we fly back up into the air, all I have to do is take these keyframes from the very beginning and I'm just gonna copy and paste them into place. So we get this right back up, nice sense of weight. The other thing is now that we come back towards the ground, we also want to feel that squash and stretch. We want it to feel like it's made contact. So I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to grab, set these keyframes because I know I want it to be a perfect circle. And once it hits, I'm going to grab my squashed point right here. I'm going to copy and paste those. I'm going to move forward just a couple frames. And these are just rough keyframes right now. I may end up moving them along. It's just to give me a sense of, hey, is things working? So we're now out the gate, we're looking at this and this already starts to feel much better. We get a nice squash and stretch. We feel like the shape's actually deforming. Let's have a little bit of fun. Now we wanna do some smears. We wanna add that little bit of, you know, motion blur. And if we look at our example, it's just a quick little snap. You don't want a smear to last more than two frames. So here's what I wanna point out. I love Echo. Echo works amazing for a lot of, types of movement that you can get. In a case of a ball bounce or when an object follows the same path that it's traveling, it can break a lot. So I'm gonna show you this like it's a poor stupid infomercial where somebody can't pour a cup of water without using this product that they're trying to sell you. But if we move forward, you can see what Echo does is it starts to repeat that shape and it looks at the time in seconds. So if I go negative one, it will be one second before Echo kicks in. 
we need that to be far less than that. So we'll go negative 0 0.001. As we start to go, we can't see much, so we'll move the number of echoes up. And now we're starting to get a little bit of that smear, which looks really good, except for as it starts to follow the same path. You'll see, we go down, we hit the ground, and as it's flying back up, the object never followed it all the way to the ground. Um, I mean, technically it did. If we go in and we start doing decay and intensities, we can see that, but it just becomes a lot of, you're messing with the program now. You're not allowed to just be creative, you're fighting tools. And that's never a good way to work. The other reason why I like doing this with a square is, let's just say you like doing scale and you're like, cool, Steve, I'm just gonna do scale. And I'm like, all right, I got it. If I go in here and I twirl this option down, I go into contents, ellipse, and I right click and I convert that to a Bezier path so I actually can mess with the handles. As I move forward and I wanna squash or if I wanna stretch this, start to pull this out, you're gonna see you're getting like kind of a weird taper and it may work for what you're looking for. I personally don't tend to go that route because now I have four points, I have a lot of handles and if I'm even like the slightest bit off on anything, you're gonna start getting really weird and organic sloppy shapes. In my opinion, just not a clean way to work. So let's undo all of that. Let's go back into our circle. And now we have this thing set up with a square. So we're gonna have 90 degree edges. It's much easier to adjust a shape like this. So we want that smear to be at our fastest point. So it looks like we go the quickest in between frame three and four. And at five, we start to slow down. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to try to copy and paste some keyframes. So it's essentially the same thing all the way up. This is more of a cell animation approach where you're forcing it to do what you want it to. And I'm just gonna grab this path. I'm gonna look at the frame before we're at the ground. Let's go to this frame. Let's grab these key or these points. Let's pull it down and let's say it got stuck to the ground for a frame. On the second one, we're gonna move forward. I just hit control right arrow to go frame by frame or left arrow. We can even pull that down just a little bit further. So it's more of a abrupt snap. So let's look at this. And if I need to, if this starts to get a little bit too sharp, I can go in and I can adjust my radius. That becomes way too much of an oval for me, but either way I have control and I have control quickly. And if I watch that, that looks good. So now if I do a RAM preview, I get a nice, beautiful, quick smear. I wasn't over here messing with all of these tools counter animating. I wasn't dealing with all these weird Bezier handles. I just got to go in and make those adjustments. So now if I'm working with a creative director and he looks at this or she looks at this and is like, ah, it's too much, I don't like it. It's literally as simple as me just going in, grabbing these and moving it up. So now we have a little bit less. It takes seconds versus becoming more problematic. And sometimes that's the name of the game, being able to have quick turnaround. So we go back and if I want it also on the bottom, I'm gonna look at where's our fastest point? Where do we travel the most? And here we had a two frame smear. So we know we hit the ground at frame 18. So let's go 17 and 16 is where we'll have a smear. Let's grab this, move it over. Let's go here. I'm gonna copy and paste those same keyframes. I'm gonna drag this thing rather than up, I'm gonna drag it down to our hit point. I'm gonna move forward a frame, that looks nice. Everything looks like it's collapsing in on itself. If we watch, now we get a nice little snap back. All you did was a basic ball bounce with a square and then using rounded corners to get there. All right, so in this example that you're seeing right here that I created with Ellen, and the furrow, you can see that I have the same principle happening, the exact same technique that we just talked about. You can see that that's what I'm using to kind of launch this out into outer space. But you'll notice that it happens at an angle. Now, if we jump back over into our comp, we'll just name this circle so it stays somewhat clean. If I want this thing to happen at an angle, I can't necessarily just go in and rotate it because then we're gonna get weird hiccups. So we're gonna do this in the most user-friendly way. I'm gonna, on a PC, hitting Control, Shift, Alt, Y, create a null object. If you want, you can also go into Layer, New, Null Object and find it there. But I definitely recommend learning your quick keys. I'm gonna move this down to the floor. Anywhere, essentially, I want this to rotate from is where I'm gonna put this. And I'm just gonna go to our parent link and pick whip from the circle to our null. 
I can name this rotate so I'm nice, clean, and organized. And since these both work together, my preferred way of working is I'll color them the same thing so it's easy for me to see. I can go in here. Let's just try to rotate this. Let's go 30 degrees. And if we watch it, now we're shooting out on an angle. And if we need to make any adjustments or changes, I can always go back, set this to zero, and go back and mess with my keyframes that way. Or if we're, say, back at 30, and I say, uh, that's not far enough. I want that to actually go farther. Well, all I'm doing is a Y position move. All right, and that's it. I'm gonna go in, let's zero this back out so we're at the ground level. We can go in, we can move this back to the center if I want. I can always create a background. I'll just steal this one that I have with a ramp with background colors, throw it over here, let's drop it to the bottom. And if you wanna get in and you wanna start making cast shadows or any type of ground shadow, Endless possibilities to do that. One little quick bonus technique at the very end. What I love to do, Control-Alt-Y. It's going to create an adjustment layer. If I go in, let's grab an Eclipse Ellipse tool. Let's draw what our cast shadow would be. Like, let's just imagine the light shining down here. I mean, we could spend days just talking about lighting. And I'm going to add a levels effect. Let's go in and let's just kind of darken this up a bit. Now, holding Control-Shift-H, turning off my visibility, You'll see that in doing this, I'm creating more of a darker tone. Now, why I love doing this stuff with adjustment layers, like go in, spend some time, you'll animate this obviously as an object leaves the ground, the shadow is going to become lighter, it'll grow larger. But if a client's watching this and they want the background to be a different color, maybe um, I show this and they're like, hey, can we flip this background color? All I have to do is swap colors and my adjustment layer is darkening whatever the color value is underneath it. So if I poorly show, you can see how my shadow color changes depending on what the color is under. So it's just another way that makes my life easier long term with clients in making quick adjustments. And that's it. It's pretty straightforward and so much fun when you're not fighting the program anywhere near as much and you can just focus on your principles of animation. Once you get that done, be sure to post this and tag School Motion and myself in this so we can check out your progress. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you'll be notified when we release another video. And finally, if you're looking to step up your After Effects game or get a better handle on the foundation, be sure to check out Animation Bootcamp and After Effects Kickstart. Each course is packed with lessons to get you to your next level.